different degree opportunities there are in biomed sciences, and she'll explain that further. So take it away, Tara. Well, hi, everybody. I am super excited to see all of you here. Um, I always like to remind folks that I made my slides, so I know what they say. So today is clearly not about me. So feel free to jump in if I am confusing. If you have questions, there'll be lots of chances for y'all to jump in and either unmute and um, ask your question out loud or post in the chat. I'll ask you a handful of questions throughout the presentation to just try to calibrate myself and the panelists to sort of who's in the room and what's on y'all's mind. Um, I'm hoping to take up about 15 minutes and then kick it over to the panel because I think that's who's brought you here today. So my goal is really to give you all a foundation for what is research and what is biomedical sciences so that when you hear from our three biomedical sciences on the panel, you know what the heck they're talking about. So I'm gonna share my screen here and um, bring up some PowerPoint slides. So my name's Tara, I work in the School of Medicine here at the University of New Mexico, and I work in an office called the Research Education Office. So we try to connect students like you, the folks in the room, to research opportunities. And so in order to even understand what that means, we're gonna talk a little bit about what research is. And specifically, we're focused on research in the biomedical sciences. So we're gonna to talk today about what biomedical sciences is. We'll talk a little bit about what different schooling options y'all have if you get curious about biomed sciences, and some of the careers that are available. But mostly we're gonna hear about careers and schooling from our panelists. Um, and then a little bit about if you are curious about biomedical sciences, how you can start exploring that field and how you might start preparing yourself to go to school to study biomed sciences more. And then number five, hearing from our panelists. So I wanna start out by having y'all post in the chat what you think research is or what do you think of when you hear the word research and why do you think research is important? And I'll give you a couple minutes to post in the chat and I'll be reading your answers out loud as they come in. I dare someone to kick us off and say what they think research is. All right, research is a systematic approach to find answers to questions and to share those answers. Research is learning and exploring new things to make our lives better, trying to find answers to solutions. I love all of these. How about why is research important? So we've already seen make our lives better. What else? Why is research important? Reading and writing, I agree, Erica. Going into depth about what you're trying to learn. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna run with, yeah. Here we go. Research is important because it helps us learn, grow, and help potentially. Yeah, research also has the potential to do harm, which is why studying the ethics of research and how to do research that minimizes harm is super important. Understand topic in depth. All right, great. Y'all have convinced me that you know what research is. So what I wrote up here is um, using a step by step process to answer a question or solve a problem. So y'all landed that one. And totally, research is um, a way to improve our lives, a way to understand the world around us, to understand our bodies. And so one of the things that I think is important is to recognize that everybody in this space right now is already a researcher. And I know you're already a researcher because I know you have done at least one of the things on this list here. So you've noticed a problem, you've asked a question, you've wanted to make something better, you've wanted to help other people, help yourself, you've wanted to learn something, um, I get lost in Wikipedia. That's like my pastime now, now that I'm not in school and I don't have homework anymore. I spend like three hours a day, just like clicking Wikipedia links and getting super lost in all of the content there. Um, you've invented something. Um, when I was a kid, I like to brag that I invented those Christmas tree light nets that go on bushes. I remember my dad putting Christmas tree lights up and I was like, dad, this seems really like arduous. I had an excellent vocabulary as a kid too. Um, so this seems really hard. You're just like winding these lights all around. It takes you forever. You could just like have a net and like throw it on the tree. And then we were driving around later that weekend. And I was like, there's nets on trees with Christmas lights. So even as a kid, I was like starting to invent things that could make our lives better um, or more efficient. Um, and then done something just to observe what happened. So this one, uh, whenever I'm on a hike, I always say like, I want things to like smell good, 
be soft, um, be pretty. So I'm like smelling things, I'm touching things. I'm like, hey, stranger, come over here and like feel this leaf. So that's researcher behavior, right? So if you've ever done any of that stuff, you're just like poked something just to see what it did. That's researcher behavior. And so what I wanna hear from in the audience, because I know you all have done research, is when have you done research and what have you learned from it? Some of you might've done research in high school. There might be undergrads in the room. There might be full-blown researchers who get paid to do research here. So when have you done research and what have you learned? I'm looking at the chat here to read stuff out loud. Doing research daily, Alexis writes, because I'm a librarian, which means I must love doing research. You're gonna be doing it your whole life. I want to hear from someone who did um, research in high school, maybe, because I think um, we start research early and we learn a lot of cool stuff from our early research projects. Or anybody who's done like a science fair or even like a history research project, if someone's researched art. Um, during school, I've learned that you can't be too subtle. You need to research a topic that correlates with your main topic and look up things that you feel are important. Absolutely. Yeah, when I'm talking to early career researchers, I'm usually asking them like, what are the Wikipedia pages you get lost in? When you're hanging out with your friends, what are they always like rolling their eyes? Like, shut up about da 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 da. Like, shut up about capitalism. Shut up about um, how uh, CO2, I don't know, whatever. Um, what are those things that your friends like roll their eyes about? Cause you never shut up about it. And those are some of the things that you might be inherently motivated to research. So um, while I wait for any more folks to chime in on things that they've researched, I research um, when I was in school, gay and transgender kids in school. And what were some of the factors that related to how those kids learned? And when I started reading about this topic that I was interested in, I started seeing that all of the research we had was showing us that gay and trans kids weren't doing well in school, that their straight and cisgender peers were often doing a lot better. And I thought that can't be the case for every kid. And so I started doing research at some local public middle schools and I found that the gay and trans kids at these schools, the gay kids in particular at the school was, were doing just as well as their straight peers. And so I thought that's really interesting. Why is that happening? Cause that's not what former research that published that is published shows. And what I found is that the school had a very supportive culture. And so there were teachers who were gay, who were out. They had a gay straight alliance that was extremely active. They had books about gay people in their classrooms. And so it was a school that had a lot of support for these kids. And so one of the things that I wanted to explore more is really testing that hypothesis. So my hypothesis was that the culture of the school was extremely supportive and that's why gay kids and straight kids did just as well in school as compared to other schools that were looked at where they didn't. And so that was my hypothesis that I wanted to test in future studies was looking at things like how many teachers are out, do these schools have gay straight alliances, what are sort of the textbooks or lessons that are in classrooms and how do they teach about gay kids? So that's one example of research that someone in this space has done. Okay, let me share my screen again. Um, okay, somebody did some fancy science research uh, that I don't know how to say all the words to. Researching nitabiotic resistance and acid mine drain into Animus River during undergrad. That sounds really cool and fancy. Um, <laughs> research in high school on the effects of hypoxia on temperature regulation in invertebrates. Okay, also sounds fancy and cool. Um, way to go team, lots of researchers in the room. Okay, so um, who makes a good researcher? So this is a slide that I built today. I um, One of the things that I think is really cool is trying to demystify research, demystify graduate school, demystify school. Like what does it take to be a good researcher? And so here are some of the things that I brainstormed, but I'd love to hear more in the chat, especially since all of us are researchers. So I'm not the only person who understands research here. So I think people who are good researchers are curious. 
um, that idea of like poking things just to see what they do. People who are creative, um, good listeners and observers. A lot of research is taking in what we see around us or what people are saying around us and sort of thinking, um, what do we want to test about that or what comes next? Uh, I think researchers are patient. Um, a lot of times when we try things in science and research, it doesn't work the first time. And so folks who are um, stick with science and research tend to be patient. They're willing to wait for these results. And I, so again, folks that um, don't give up easily. And then the other one that I added is I think researchers are caring. And I think that researchers are people who are um, good and good at and interested in building relationships with other people because we're, we're here because um, many of us are here because we care about people. And I think if you're not careful as a researcher or a scientist or an engineer, it can be really easy to be inventing things or doing things that cause harm. And so for me, a good researcher is someone who is caring and who thinks about the impacts of their work. Um, so does anybody want to jump in and add to that list? We've got another researcher here, our panelist. Um, in high school, I did research into public policy and its effect on international peacekeeping. Cool. Did I miss anything from my list of researchers? Driven, motivated, and dedicated. Cool. All right, sweet. Flexibility, totally. Thanks, Jessica. Outstanding. Yes, we're all outstanding. Thanks, Lainey. All right, feel free to keep chiming in. So why might you try research? So one of the things that I think is really cool about a career in research or going to school in research is that you're really taking on a life of learning, a life of playing, being creative, and a life of engaging with the world and with others around you. And that is a really cool way to spend your time. Um, so you can learn about people, animals, nature, the world, the universe, really anything that you want to learn about, you can be a researcher in, um, how to better understand and support your community, how to explore your interests, building relationships with those around you, building relationships with yourself. A lot of people say research is me-search, especially in the social sciences. We start asking questions based on our own lived experience and wondering, am I alone in this or are there other folks going through this too? And then if you're early in your career, trying on research is a way to understand your options for college majors and um, a way to explore different careers that might be available to you. Um, we've got W. Darwin chiming in on what makes a good researcher, being objective, knowing how to fail when your hypothesis doesn't go to one's conclusions. Yep, totally, lots of fail. What I like to say, fail is an acronym for the first attempt in learning because I'm a total cheese ball working in higher ed and research. Um, science is a lot about failure and keeping going. Okay, so I'm from the UNM School of Medicine and the Research Education Office. So what, what do we do? We help connect students like you all to um, biomedical science and research opportunities. So when you, what do you think of? So we've just talked about what research is. What do you think of when you hear the words biomedical science? You're working with biology? Say it again. You're working with biology? Totally, working with biology, absolutely. What's the second word in that? It's medical. Sure, yeah, totally. Working in labs. Yeah, so what I've come up with a way to like demystify it and try to make it super simple. Um, is that biomed science and research tends to look at public health and medicine, public health being things that make you healthy or sick and medicine um, looking at how the body works. So absolutely. So our biomed science students here at UNM choose from a lot of different research areas. And some of those appear here on, it's on the left side of my screen. So under research area. So cancer, cardiovascular physiology, infectious disease, medical imaging, metabolic disease, molecular genetics, neuroscience, pharmaceutical sciences. And I literally spent my morning Googling these things to try to put it in simple terms to tell people who don't know what biomed sciences is, what I think these terms are. And so my background is engineering and psychology. I'm not a biomedical scientist. So from Googling the biomedical scientists in the room, here's what I think you all do. 
I think that you look at the growth of abnormal cells. I think that you look at the heart and blood vessels. I think you look at how bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites make us sick. Um, I think you look at how we use technology to see the body. So taking scans of the body to see our organs, to see our brain. I think that you look at um, what's happening in the body when we can't turn our food into energy. Um, so things like diabetes. I think that you look at our genes and our DNA. And I think that you look at our nervous system and our brain. And I think that you look at how medicine operates in our body to make, it, make us healthy or sick. And I think you look at the environment and how things in the environment influence our body and make us healthy or sick. And I can't see any faces, but um, maybe some nods if I got that right. Got some nods. Cool. Okay. So um, our students focus on lots of different things. So they look at COVID-19, of course, they're looking at Ebola, diabetes, things that we inherit, fetal alcohol syndrome, how our brains work, Alzheimer's disease in the environment. We've got a lot of folks looking at um, things locally, including one of our panelists looking at abandoned uranium mines, looking at how silver work affects people who are doing silver work and wood smoke in houses, how um, heating your home with wood burning stoves affects your health, looking at drug delivery. So all of that to say is we care about these things and these things affect how we move through the world. And so we need biomedical scientists. And not only do we need biomedical scientists, but we need them at all levels. And depending on how long you want to go to school, you can absolutely be a biomedical scientist. I'm convinced that you could be one with, um, with any schooling, totally, like we're all researchers right now. But if you're curious about college and you want to get a bachelor's degree, you can absolutely get paid to be a biomedical scientist and have a career in that. You can go on and get your master's and take on even more, or you can go on and get a PhD and go to school for a really long time and work really hard and then work really hard for the rest of your life being a researcher. So what does this kind of look like? Um, with a bachelor's degree, you are entry level. So you're absolutely doing biomedical science. You're absolutely doing experiments. You're part of a team and you can work in lots of different places. So some of the employers that I brainstormed are Tricor, which processes um, samples here locally. They were a huge player in processing COVID tests. Um, the national labs in New Mexico hire biomedical scientists, universities everywhere do. UNM is a huge employer of research technicians doing biomed science work. Different governments and tribes hire biomedical scientists and biotech companies hire biomedical scientists. So if you wanna keep going to school and maybe have the opportunity to get paid a little bit more for work, um, getting a master's degree is focused on extending your knowledge. So you're taking what you've learned in undergrad and you're building on that a little bit more to get a little more specific in something. Here you can really start designing experiments. You can manage a team so you can work in a lab and manage the different people that work on all these different experiments. You can start to teach at a community college. So if you wanna um, teach folks like that you grew up, you know, grew up in the area where you grew up at a community college, um, you can do that with a master's degree. And a lot of people get a master's degree to prepare for even more school. Um, and so if you wanna keep going to school, you can get a PhD. And folks who get a PhD are, um, they tend to be people who are gonna be in charge. So they're gonna lead and work with lots of different people on lots of different experiments. So instead of sort of leading a small team on um, a handful of experiments, you lead, can lead a much bigger team who are working on a lot of different experiments to address um, a really big question. Like, I think I might have one on a slide later. Um, so a lot of folks with a PhDs are responsible for getting funding. So you're kind of responsible for the livelihood of a lot of different people because the money that you get to do your science also employs other researchers. So um, there's a lot of responsibility on folks who have a PhD. You can be a professor at a university. A lot of folks who get PhDs end up starting biotech companies. So they're entrepreneurs. And a lot of folks with PhDs end up being advisors. So we've heard about Dr. Fauci in the news media. So this is a, a person who is an advisor for lots of people around the world in biomedical science. Um, so what's the difference between a bachelor's degree, an undergrad degree, and a PhD? Um, undergrad is really classes focused. So you're really trying to take on and learn what we already know. So what do researchers, scientists, and people already know in this field? And that's what undergrad is kind of focused on. And a lot of our undergrads 
So they're focused on coursework, but they're doing research on the side. Once you get to the PhD, that sort of flips. So it's really research focused and a lot less classes. So at this point, we're really hoping that you've already built your foundation of what we sort of know about a field. And now your goal is to extend that knowledge and learn just sort of like what's going on right now in research and then be part of the, the team in the world that moves that knowledge forward. So you're applying what you already know. And really importantly, you're looking at questions that folks haven't asked. You're designing experiments to explore how things work in ways that we don't understand. So you're on the frontiers, you're doing novel and new things. So this is the, the question that I was gonna try to um, say earlier, but was afraid to say it out loud. So what type of immune response is needed to pr um, protect against COVID or other novel infectious diseases? So this is an extremely big question that somebody could spend their entire life studying and maybe still like never completely understand. So exploring it to try to understand it more and more and more. I think folks who are um, who pursue research are lifelong learners. They're people who understand that there really is no destination for our learning. They're, they're just getting closer and closer and it, um, to the truth and to a deepening understanding of something. So um, Erica already said, read a lot, write a lot. So um, what can you do now? So maybe you're curious about getting paid to think and learn and play and be creative all day as a researcher. So what can you do now, wherever you are in your career to sort of move yourself towards that? You can read a lot and read broadly. When I was teaching a first year undergrad class on research, I thought about assigning fiction because I never, I didn't read any fiction books while I was an undergrad and I'm so sad about it. Um, reading is really important and reading lots of different things from lots of different places. And I think the skill that's most important for you to develop is to connect what you're reading to the world you see around you and to your own life. So this is called text to life connections. And the idea is that what you're reading, you can think about it beyond that, that, that stuff that's on the page and sort of extend it to what you see around you and to the people around you. Similarly, you can take writing projects seriously. We get assigned all of these papers and these five paragraph essays in every class that we ever take. And I rolled my eyes every single time until I got this far along in my career. And I realized that folks don't know how to say what they mean in an email. And that's because they don't know how to say what they mean in writing. And so what I want you to do is take writing projects seriously. Every time somebody gives you feedback and says like, this thing isn't clear, instead of being mad at them for giving you a lower grade or whatever, ask yourself, how could I have been more clear? How can I communicate my ideas in writing? Because it's an extremely important skill wherever you go. And ultimately to tell stories. I think we don't talk enough about the fact that researchers are telling us a story about what they're seeing in numbers, about what they're seeing in groups of people, about what they're seeing in the world. So if you take those writing projects seriously, you'll develop your ability to tell a story which is frankly applicable in whatever career you go into or whatever life you choose. And then learn a lot. I think you see a lot of presentations like this that say, get good grades, get a 3.0, get a 4.0, whatever. And honestly, um, I just want you to learn a lot. The grades will follow. If you're learning a lot, you'll get good grades. Sometimes you'll meet a jerk who dings you for no good reason on something, but you'll get to say, I know I learned a lot. You don't bug me. So, um, Every time you take a class, it's an opportunity to develop your knowledge that you're going to build on for your lifetime. I totally got through my undergrad doing uh, learning stuff just for the test. And then as soon as I took that test, I released it and I didn't really learn it. And what a waste of four years of my life. I wish I would have learned a lot more in undergrad. So um, learn a lot about lots of different things, because the whole point of being a scientist and a researcher is making connections between things that no one has ever really connected before. That's how we extend um, our knowledge as humans. So earn strong grades, whatever, that'll happen once you're learning. All right, take science classes. And why do I care that you take science classes? One, you're building that foundational knowledge of science that you're gonna build on for the rest of forever. But because being a researcher is about developing hypotheses, so it's about saying like, I think, I think this is gonna happen and here's why based on what I know. And then here's how I'm gonna test it to see if that's what happens. Same with math. I think a lot of folks are really afraid of numbers, um, but numbers can be kind of fun to play with. And honestly, researchers use numbers to tell stories. Not all research, researchers, some researchers play more in qualitative data than quantitative. They play more with um, narrative than with numbers. But for many researchers, they're using numbers to tell stories. 
okay, practice teaching and mentoring, science is no good if it's in only your head. The whole point of science is to give it to everybody else. I took all of this time and spent all of this energy learning this thing and I give it away so that we all have it. So practice teaching, telling your story and mentoring. You're gonna be teaching and mentoring no matter what career you go into. Talk to people you care about and specifically talk to them about what they care about. A lot of you are here because you um, wanna help people. And if we don't engage with the folks we wanna help, we don't know what their problems are or what solutions they think might work. So be super engaged with the folks that you care about. Um, and if you're curious about being a scientist or whatever it is, you can replace scientist with artist, with writer, whatever. Talk to folks who are doing that and ask them, what's your best day? What's your worst day? What advice um, do you wish you would have had? Which is part of what this panel is, is you're gonna get to talk to folks who are doing this thing, who are gonna give you advice about what they wish they would have known. And then the last one, the elusive, try to get research experience. So how do you learn if you like something? You try it. So if you're curious about being a researcher, I would invite you to try it. It's super hard to volunteer these days. Um, we don't like putting folks into labs who aren't getting paid or compensated for their work. So how do you get around that? You can take courses if you're in college, you can take lab classes and research classes. Um, if you have an honors program at your school, you can try to get engaged in an honors or thesis project. Every time you get an opportunity to do a research post uh, paper in a class, I invite you to think about a topic that's actually interesting to you and not a topic that you can just write about quickly to get the paper done. Actually think about using your time in a way that um, lets you explore something you're curious about. You can work in labs for credit. So through our program, I'll tell you about, we have a, a class called Biomed 410 where students come into labs and do research projects to get credit toward their bachelor's degree, their undergrad degree. And then the way that I most tell students to try is to try to get into a paid research program. I had to work a handful of jobs while I was in college. And one of the best things I ever did was stop slinging sandwiches for a living and start doing research. Um, I needed to make money regardless so that I could survive. And so it was way better for me to work in research that was related to what I was studying than to be working in retail. So if you can try to find a way to make money doing research so that um, you have what you need to survive, but you're also getting experience um, that might help you in the future. So um, I always tell folks to take a screenshot screenshot or take a photo of this slide. There's too much text to really go over, but this is a great starting point if you're curious about research. These are super UNM focused, but for the folks um, in the room who are from different universities, you probably have similar programs. So you could type in your university's name and then undergraduate research and see what comes up. Undergrad research programs in the summer are a super cool way to explore different parts of the world. So if you've always wanted to live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, or Los Angeles, or Spain, try to see if they have undergrad research programs in an area where you want to explore and go there for the summer and get paid to be there. Um, and then what I would also say is just to take whatever program you select, there's usually going to be an application process. I want you to take that application process seriously. There's usually folks applying from all over the country, all over the world to get into these programs. Um, and so have somebody look at your essay, have somebody look at your resume, have somebody who you care about and trust give you advice on putting together an application that really tells your story. And then at the bottom here, number eight, um, I have my name and my email address. So this is super broad and you're all unique individual people. Um, I invite you to send me a message if you're curious and let's get together over Zoom or if you're in Albuquerque, we can get together over coffee and talk about who you are and what you're thinking about and what are maybe some cool next steps. So for the UNM folks in the room, I wanna take just a quick moment to tell you about two of our programs um, in case you wanna get involved in research. So um, the first one is actually not just UNM, this is recruiting anybody in the US. So these are for current undergrads. You can't be graduating before summer. So you have to be coming back for the fall after the summer. Um, we start in May through August. This is a one-on-one -on -one research project mentored by one-on-one -on -one by a faculty member. Um, you do your own personal project based on your interest. We do cohort building activities. So we'll take you whitewater rafting. We'll take you on the tram. Um, we'll go rock climbing. So we, we work hard, we play hard kind of stuff. And we pay $5,000 for the summer. And I'm really hoping that we can increase that soon. And the application is due in February. So plenty of time for you to explore UPN. The website's down here. 
ask somebody cool for a letter of reference. We really want this to be from a professor who's either seen you do research or seen you do well in class. So they've seen those aspects of curiosity, persistence, et cetera. Um, the next one is for just our UNM students in the room. So this runs every semester, fall, spring, summer. You're doing a mentored research project in a lab with a professor for credit. So the last slide was a paid summer program. This one is course credit for doing research for our UNM students. And the website is there at the bottom. Most folks are doing about 10 hours a week to get three credit hours. So um, this is a slide I tried to find like a photo of Nemo and it just, I ran out of time, it didn't go well, but just keep swimming. So what can you do now? Try stuff that you're curious about and really most importantly reflect. It's really okay for you to not like stuff. If you try a math and science class, and you don't like it, try another one. If by the third time you don't like it, maybe you don't need to do science for your whole life. I don't need you to commit to things that you don't like doing. So reflection about what you like and don't like is super important. Um, when you like something, pay attention to that. How can you get more of that? And when you don't like it, how can you get less of that? Um, once you figure out what you like, how can you get, keep getting better and better at it? Talk to people about your plans. I don't think anybody is born knowing how to become a biomedical scientist. Heck, biomedical science is kind of like made up by humans. So we have to learn what that is from other humans. We need to find teachers and mentors to help us get where we want to go and get help when you're stuck. So find people who want to get to know you, who care about you, and can help you make a plan to do what you want to do. So with that, I wanted to open up the chat for anything that is holding you back from exploring your career in biomedical science. And I'm hoping that the responses to this question will help our panelists have a starting point for where they might be able to reach you all. So our website is below that question, along with my name and my email address. I really mean it. I do this because I care about students. Um, I much prefer hanging out with you, getting coffee and talking about your goals than checking 50 Outlook emails. So please save me, send me a message and let's get together and talk about where you wanna go. Thank you all for your time. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Micah to introduce the panelists. Thank you, Tara. All right, round of applause. If you wanna show some emoji reactions, go for it. Uh, excellent uh, presentation and overview of research and just you know the different opportunities that there are, especially the UPN program, um, getting the chance to go even um mount rock climbing that sounds fun <laughs> um but you touched on a lot of excellent points especially like reading and writing and just getting comfortable with that i think that it stood out to me resonated with me but um any questions from the audience feel free to throw them in the chat i'll try my best to just monitor that as well um okay here so if there's, I'm not seeing a whole lot come in, but that's okay. You're all digesting the information, simmer on it, <laughs> uh, take it all in. But I think we can transition now into our panel session, which I'm excited for to see some, um, you know, alumni that I've, you know, come to know a little bit from their time here at UNM and also to meet a new person, Jade. Um, I get to learn more about your experience and your story pursuing higher education and uh, pursuing this particular field. So how we have this structured is, I kind of have it broken down into parts. Um, so what we'll do first, uh, we'll just give time to our panelists for basic introductions. Everybody can do their name, where you're from, if you wanna share your clans, your tribe that you're from, go for it. And then after that part, um, we'll dive into your story and go from there. So let me call on uh, Jade, if you could go first, if you don't mind, Jade. Um, Jade, tell us uh, where you're from. If you wanna share your tribes or clans, go for it. Uh, hi, I'm Jade. Um, I'm Navajo in Northern Arapaho and I go to Fort Lewis College and cool. great. Well, thanks, Jade. 
I'll turn it over to Jessica. Go ahead, Jessica. Jessica Bigay in the Senate Bethlehem Michelin, the Bethlehem Bashishi, uh, Oestane Dashinale, and uh, Kiani Dashiche, um, Sehoto de Dashagan. So I am, uh, my name's Jessica Bigay. I am originally from Fort Defiance, Arizona, and I am also Navajo, um, and I live here in Albuquerque currently. Thanks, Jessica. I think I just, sorry, I forgot I was not muted. I just saw Josh's face light up at one of your clans. So I'm guessing he made a connection there, but. Oh, really? Which, which yeah. clan? We'll find out here. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, Josh, if you want to introduce yourself, share with your tribe, your clans, go for it. Yeah, it's a, um, Josh, it's a, it's a, it's a, I am from Farmington, New Mexico. I um, also spent a lot of my uh, childhood in Upper Fruitland, New Mexico as well I'm with my grandparents. Um, currently in Cincinnati at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I'm a pediatrics resident. I'm in my last year. Uh, apl uh, <clears throat> I'm applying for a neonatology fellowship. Uh, really interested in continuing on there. Great. Well, thank you for your quick introductions. Now we're going to dive more into your story. Uh, we'll give you each some time about five to seven ish minutes, but it's pretty flexible. But basically saying like, how did you get from there to here? Do that all within five minutes. <laughs> JK, but um, maybe mostly just sharing some highlights from your journey so far that you think our audience can benefit from as it relates to the biomed sciences field, um, and we'll go from there and I'll mix it up. And if I could call on Jessica to start us off first, go ahead, Jessica. Sure. Also, I realized I didn't say what I am. <laughs> um, my current position is uh, I'm the research information specialist um, for one of the labs in the uh, College of Pharmacy. So um, I've been working for him and um, the advisor for that lab is, was actually my graduate mentor. So um, he liked me enough to keep me around. <laughs> um, yeah, so my here to there story, it's pretty much, um, let me see. So I started going to, I did my undergrad in UNM. Um, I got it in my bachelor of sciences in biology and I minored in professional writing. Um, so that combination was already um, different in its own because I personally love writing. So I wanted to keep that up, but I also had my intention set on going to medical school and being a surgeon and all this other stuff, um, which is cool. Um, but eventually um, I realized that that's not really what I wanted to do. Um, I did love science. Um, I actually was horrible at science in high school. Um, I failed biology and chemistry <laughs> um, every semester in high school, but, um, and I think that's kind of where it started. I wanted to challenge myself and I wanted to um, go to college with a clean slate and actually, um, actually just pay attention in my classes this time. And so uh, I decided to go with biology. Uh, my mother was also a biology degree. Uh, my parents are both scientists in a way, Mom, like I said, my mom did a science degree and my dad also did a science degree and he currently runs a clinical laboratory um, back home at the uh, Fort Defiance Medical Center. So um, I've been around science for a while. So I've kind of found that interesting. But um, <clears throat> so I finished that, um, did my degrees. And then after I finished college, I also realized, which um, Tara actually highlighted in her um, introduction, the difference between the undergrad and a graduate degree is specificity. And so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a little bit more specific because biology in itself as a degree, it's kind of broad and um, there's really no specificity. And so I know that I wanted to be a little bit more specific in uh, some type of profession. And uh, there's different routes that could go with biology, you know, um, conservation, ecology, those are all great, those are all fun. Um, but I wanted to go more towards the 
public health and health sciences route because um, what influenced me from my culture is in, in Navajo, we have the idea of eh or family um, that, extend, that extends further than the blood. Um, and that can go into your community, um, external family, even like your close friends. So I've always, I was raised with that idea and I wanted to carry that out further. Um, I wanted to do something more with my degree, whatever my profession was, I wanted to give back and help out my family. And so um, <clears throat> in a way, uh, that's kind of my mentality that I had. And um, I took advantage of a post-baccalaureate program um, that the Department of Biology offered called the Post-Baccalaureate Research Experience Program or PREP. So I took advantage of that. And that's kind of how I got introduced to the biomedical sciences and um, how research worked in academia and everything. And I honestly, I liked it. Um, I didn't think I would, but I did. <laughs> so um, my advisor uh, back then, she encouraged me to apply for the uh, BSGP and introduced me to some faculty members at the time. I talked to them and um, it was highly encouraged for me to do the PhD. Um, but honestly, um, I didn't really want to jump into the PhD just yet uh, because I knew how much of a responsibility it would be to have a PhD. Um, yes, the salary is very enticing, <laughs> but also as Tara mentioned, it's a lot of responsibility and it's a lot of work. And I wasn't sure that I would be prepared for that. So I wanted to get my master's first to figure out if that's what I truly wanted to do. Um, granted, I was on a PhD route for a little bit, but later through um, advisory and everything found out that right now, um, the master's is the perfect route for me right now. And so um, I finished that degree maybe like two, about two years ago now. And um, honestly, <laughs> my path from here to there is very rocky and there was no set plan. Um, from the moment I started college to graduating college to where I am now, I didn't exactly have my to-do list. And I, 10 years, 10 years ago, I never would have thought this is what I would do. <laughs> So um, my route is basically like, I really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I kind of just fell into it, but also as Tara highlighted, um, I communicated, I extended, I made friends, I networked and I sought advice in which ways that I wanted to do. And I did, saw what I liked, saw what I didn't like and um, went from that. A lot of it was trial and error, honestly. So um, it was a long, rough path, but that's kind of, in a nutshell, my story. Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate it. Yeah, definitely um, lots of good lessons learned. Appreciate you being candid with that. Um, and also reflecting back on why you do this for your for your people and for your family, for sure. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, so now we'll turn it over to Jade. I'll call on you next, Jade. Um, if you can tell us your story in five to seven minutes, how you got from there to here on the Zoom call in Durango, <laughs> go for it. Oh, I forgot to, where I'm, or to say where I'm from. I'm from uh, Shiprock, New Mexico. Um, so I'm a senior here at uh, Fort Lewis. And so for my undergrad, I like kind of wanted to stay close to home. And so, which was... I guess a good thing because um so I'm like the first to go to college in my family and so it was kind of like hard my first I think couple semesters you know um I'm majoring in biology which is like a really tough topic I guess mostly because like I didn't have like a good science program at my high school and so when I came here it was like like it was so advanced I guess and you know there's a lot of people that was way ahead of me and so I struggled and I kind of found like my interest I guess and so I have a concentration in cell and molecular biology here and a minor in forensic studies so that was kind of interesting and I ch mostly chose like the science route because it's you know there's a lot of stuff that's still 
unknown and so that kind of like amazes me and you know that I guess there's a lot of things in our bodies that's you know happening even though it's like a cellular level and so um I guess uh well so I'm like I did the UPN at UNM this past summer and that was fun it kind of I needed research experience and um it gave me a lot of like like prospects into what I want might want to do you know I wanted to do the whole med school route but research kind of sounds fun right now so <laughs> and the only thing is I need to learn is probably the patients you know um the my research project we didn't there was a lot of like downtime during the experiments and we didn't get a lot of results. So that was kind of interesting to learn that you don't get results from every experiment you do. And yeah, so, and I guess like my culture, you know, there's not like we're really underrepresented in like a lot of stuff areas. So that's kind of like my motivation too, is to be like, someone that someone else can look up to like I guess grow the representation of natives in science and that's about it. Oh thanks Jade. Seeing some connections very similar to Jesse's story about you know doing programs that kind of give you that exposure and allow you to explore different things and see what you really are interested in so I'm glad there are programs like the UPN um, Undergraduate Pipeline Network there. Um, if you're hearing these acronyms, feel free to put in the chat. You can always spell it out. <laughs> um, but thanks, Jade, for sharing your story. I'll turn it now over to Josh. And uh, let me know if you need any help, Josh. I know you prepared a couple slides. So um, I'm here on standby just in case. All right, can everyone see my screen? I'm getting some nods, perfect. All right, I made just a few slides. Um, so uh, as mentioned, my name is Josh. Um, I'm a pediatrics resident. Um, I'm here in Cincinnati. This first slide just shows a little bit of the hospital that's here. This here is kind of the whole hospital. This is where we take care of patients. And then this is where science um, can take place here at the hospital. This is our main entrance. Um, this is me at UNM on match day in medical schools, my family also, uh, when we learned that we were moving to Cincinnati uh, in 2019. Um, my start, uh, so my journey to science started on the Navajo Nation. This is my uh, grandparents' home site lease in Upper Fruitland, New Mexico. Um, here's a picture of me and my grandfather. Um, he, <laughs> sitting very safely on top of a roof here that uh and he's watching um this is a house that he built um and we stayed in while he was building other property um here's kind of one of the bigger houses on the property and then here's a second house also all built by my grandfather um that really started an interest in materials and how things are put together but also family um, and thinking about how to share what you have in particular this land with those that you are important to you which is why there are so many um so many structures on the property. We had a lot of opportunities to live with cousins and aunties and uncles. It was great. Um, I went to high school in nearby Farmington, um, home of the Scorpions. This is kind of a little front marquee in front of the school. Um, in high school, I interviewed and was lucky to matriculate into the UNM BAMD program. Um, I think I have a little call out there. It is. That's me um, as a high school senior or as a recently graduated high school senior. Um, as part of this uh, brand new program at the time, started in 2006, which is when I graduated high school. That's the first time that I thought about um, really a career in medicine and also in the process of being an undergraduate, really learning about science. Um, once I was starting my time at UNM in the BAMD program, I got a chance to be part of uh, the biochemistry um, degree program. And I met a really great investigator, Carlette Pata who uh, let me join her lab. Um, and I really enjoyed the science that was being done in her lab. 
and I applied to the UNM MD PhD program. And I was also, I felt pretty lucky to be part of that group, uh, to be part of, accepted into the UNM, UNM MD, MD PhD program. Here's me um, at a 7X dissecting microscope during my graduate uh, PhD time. I worked in a laboratory um, that studied pulmonary hypertension, and I was really interested in neonatal pulmonary hypertension. We studied blood vessels and the role that a special cell type in those blood vessels maybe contributed to the develop or to the to that illness. Um, and then here's me presenting some of that work um, at a national meeting um, in a poster format. And then at as a end of this um, program, I got to defend. Here's a picture of me on my dissertation defense day. This is my mom, Shema, my dad, Shijae, that are in the audience watching. This is my advisor, Tom Resta, who's also part of the call for a little bit um, here today. And then I passed. It felt really good. Um, very, re very relieved that it worked out. Um, and then I graduated. Um, and this is a picture from the AISS graduation where graduating um, health professionals are given uh, blankets as we move on in our careers. And I uh, wanted to include this as, a, as more of a symbol for the multifaceted and many ways that I was supported through my career. And in particular, how um, it's really important to remember your heritage and where you've come from in that process. Um, and I wanted to close with this picture. Um, it's a picture of rice paddies. Um, you can see all of these fields here are flooded. I learned something interesting about rice. Um, turns out rice, even though it's grown this way, doesn't actually need a lot of water to grow. It does really well with the actually very low water. The reason rice fields are flooded is because weeds don't do well with flooded um, fields. And actually it's the weeds that mess with the rice. Um, if you don't get rid of the weeds, then your rice yield is really low. And one of the reasons I love this um, picture is it makes me think about the things that you're working toward in life, those the rice that you're trying to cultivate, and that it's not the rice itself that's going to get you in trouble or things that are going to bring you down. It's all the other stuff, all the all the um, distractions, all of the extra stuff, all those other weeds. And if you think about the good things in your life, they do well when you are able to focus and and do the work that you feel that you need to do, and you can cultivate and get things going from that standpoint. But it's the other things that really struggle when you really think about. What am I interested in? How can I focus on that? Um, and it's those other things that really kind of detract from your main ability, which is to um, think about how to make the thing that you're most interested in making in this particular example, rice. With that, I'll say uh, yeah, thank you. Here's a picture of my family before I wrap up and um, I'll be part of the panel and remain open for questions. And I will stop sharing. Well, thank you, Jade and Jessica and Joshua for each giving us a little bit of background uh, behind your story and about yourselves. Uh, we'll open up the floor now to some questions from the audience on what you've heard. Maybe there was something, someone mentioned a program. Now's the time we can explore that further, but uh, is, are there any questions from the audience? You can I mean, we're a small group, so if you want to even come off mute, you're welcome to. Or if you prefer, you can also use the chat feature. So it's kind of quiet um, on our side here, but uh, we do have a compliment about the photos and also another shout out to Jade and your fan club. So. Glad we got some supporters in the audience. Those are important. <laughs> um, but yes, thank you, Tara, for reminding me. We got a couple of questions uh, from the registration. So uh, what is it like researching or what is it like practicing research in the biomedical sciences? Um, I can open this up to anybody who's ready from our panelists. And the question is, what's what's it like researching in the biomedical sciences? Yeah, I can take that. <laughs> um, I like to explain to my friends because it sounds cooler when I talk about it than actually doing it. 
um a lot of them have in their heads like the jurassic park scene with the little raptor and the egg and everything and um i think i told my i use the word incubation or something with one of my friends that are not scientists and they thought that but um i think this leads back to those characteristics again that uh, Tara referred to. And um, a lot of, I feel like working, my experience with biomedical sciences the past couple of years is that it's not the same thing every day. And I think that's why I like it, it's because it's not the same thing. Um, so by that, I mean, you know, there's days where it's slower on the end, but um, a lot of it I've come to learn are based off of grant deadlines <laughs> the closer you are to a grant deadline the busier you are so um i feel like a lot of things kind of run on the grant cycle um i feel like it it has its busy times and then it has its lulls um so i feel like it's a mix and match and that's why i mentioned uh when tara asked the question uh flexibility and so because it's not the same thing it's not exactly um nothing sticks to a schedule <laughs> and nothing works the way you want it to um and so uh, you know we have a joke with like you know if if you're running a new assay and it works perfectly the first time that's not it's not going to happen again <laughs> you can do the same thing but it's not going to happen again and so um i think there's a lot of variability um variability with that i think tara asked what do you do during lulls and how do you stay grounded during crunch time? Oh, okay. So most of the time during lulls, um, back when I was a student, I was encouraged to read up on the topics and um, just to kind of dig in a little bit deeper to kind of use that downtime. Um, <laughs> um, writing was a big thing to do during the lulls too. Since you have all that time, you're expected to um, do write-ups that you can use. And even if it's just a small little paragraph you can put together, um, those eventually can be put into a paper to submit eventually. So that happens during the lulls. Um, staying grounded during the crunch times, um, lots of coffee, <laughs> um, that happens. But I think more recently in where I'm at now in my career and position, um, staying grounded, during the crunch times means to just be organized. Um, staying on top of it in time management really is what it comes down to. Um, <clears throat> my current position in the laboratory mixes both science and communication for myself. And so um, I'm still in the lab doing laboratory work, doing science and writing and everything else that I was doing as a grad student. But on top of that, I'm also doing um, marketing and communication for one of the centers in the colleges. So um, I'm doing web designs, I'm doing social media, I'm doing newsletters and everything. Um, so as you can imagine, it can get pretty hectic sometimes. And so the thing that I've learned to do is just to find out works, what works best for me, but also to just try to stay as organized as possible as I can and just to um, um, hold myself accountable because that's another aspect of working in biomedical sciences is um, no one's there to tell you. No one's there to tell you to get up at 6 a.m. to get this stuff done so you can have things done. Um, a lot of it is uh, self-discipline and having your own accountability for getting things done. So um, a lot of independence comes in working from biomedical science. Um, but I mean, on the main key for staying grounded during crunch time, I would say for myself, is just organization and um, keeping myself accountable, but also reaching out to current people to be like, hey, I need help with some accountability in this area. Can you just kind of, you know, help me out there? So um, that's kind of what I think my experience with biomedical science is, um, that's, that's what that, that is. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Any of the panelists want to add their, their feedback to this question? Um, I'll say quickly, <clears throat> one of the things that I loved about and what I am excited about in researching biomedical sciences are the kinds of questions you get to investigate. For example, as a grad student, um, we were really interested in newborn lung disease, which to me allowed me to think back to, well, if you are able to thought experiment back into kind of a womb, a baby in development, 
It's all liquid. There's the, it, the it, that fetus doesn't have um, the ability to breathe air. And so the lungs aren't in a space to really function on that level. And so all of the oxygenated blood that's going to that baby is being done by the placenta. And then after delivery, that's all gone. And now you have a, a, a new life that's out in the, in the world breathing air. And how does that switch happen? Um, and there are some kiddos that struggle with that switch. And so what, why is that? Um, can we learn more about it? You get a chance to think about big questions um, and also questions that um, on the surface, you may think, oh, that's really simple. I bet we know a lot about how um, an infant transitions from be like into being born, but we really don't know much. And one of the great things about it is you learn just how much we really don't know and how much there still is to learn as a society about even just even ourselves. Um, I, I'll just add that. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I think Jade mentioned that too, like this is an interesting field to explore because there's still so much unknown out there. Um, but also reflecting back to what you mentioned too, Jessica, about, you know, there can be times for lulls and it's a chance to learn more and uh, about what's already known about this topic or something. But, um, but to also just remain, I think someone commented this in the chat, uh, that research is also just being objective. Right. Sometimes you don't get the results you anticipated, uh, but you have to have that objective standpoint. <laughs> um, OK, there's nothing else. I think, uh, again, for our audience, feel free to add a question to the chat. I also forget we have this um, raise your hand feature. At least I think we do on this meeting. Um, so if you want to experiment and find that button, <laughs> I'll try and pay attention to that as well. You can also raise your hand. <gasps> Sweet. Yes. Jade's friends, they have a question for you. Jade's friends, um, feel free to come off mute if you have a question. I'll turn it over to you. We don't have a question at this time. <laughs> just kidding. You're just testing it out and showcasing it. Thank you. I'm glad it's working. I didn't know for sure if I had to enable that. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, let's see, I think we have some other questions. We kind of prep this back up. La, la, la. Okay, let's see. We kind of heard this from some of your stories, but uh, maybe if you want to expand on this further, but uh, to any of our panelists, um, let's see. How has your heritage influenced your decision to pursue or practice biomed sciences? Um, I can go first. Uh, one of the things that for me is really important um, in Navajo, there's a strong belief in continuity and in the circularity of existence um, known as Hoshon. Um, and it's about balance. And one of the, I think, beautiful things about science is an ability to not only understand how things come to be, but also in sharing that information, how to help other people give back to individuals or families that are struggling in that space. For example, a child that's sick, um, a scientist or a doctor is able to hopefully understand a little bit more about what's going on contribute to a body of knowledge that hopefully helps develop a therapy that then circles back and helps families and kiddos in that space. Um, and for me, that was really powerful. One of the other things that I really like about biomedical sciences is this emphasis on teaching and sharing. That to me resonates heavily with Hojong, that as you continue forward in your own career, it's important to remember to lift as you climb and to also think about how can you continue to help in a way that you yourself have been helped. Um, and I, I love that about um, careers in biomedical sciences. Thanks, Josh. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that part, especially about teaching and sharing, being a part of research. I think that came up for me in one of Tara's questions about like what makes a good researcher. I think if you can, you know, produce the data or findings in a way that 
is usable, right? It's not all technical or people can easily, you know, interpret that information and start prioritizing and planning around that information to make their lives better. So I think definitely teaching and sharing that to make making it easier. <laughs> so great. Um, let's see. Uh, if there's no other question or feedback here on this question, um, Jade, I'm, I'm, I'm curious a little bit more about your UPN experience. Um, can you tell us how, how you got involved with that, how you found out about it? Um, maybe there was a lesson learned from that whole experience. Um, but yeah, if you can just expand on your UPN experience, go for it. Okay, um, so I think I just needed like internships and kind of like, exposure to research because my college is kind of like research-based and I knew I wanted to go to graduate school and you know I wanted to stand out I guess and with like the whole um COVID there wasn't much for that first summer and I know my first year I didn't have like a good GPA for most of the uh programs and so I applied to a couple you know even though I didn't really have the grades well for it but um I think one of my professors sent me the program, so I, you know, I didn't really bet that I was getting into it, so, but um, I got accepted. I went down to Albuquerque for the summer, and I, it was pretty fun experience, um, you know, working one-on-one -on -one with a mentor in a, in a project that it was, I wasn't used to, mostly because I was mostly exposed to like a cellular level instead. And so my project, we worked mostly with like the, the um, uh, ma uh, like maternal milk and like treating the intestinal cells and using like the enteroids. And even that whole thing was like a, a eye opening thing. Like, you know, there's like technology that you could use to create like, um, and I guess that, and um, it was fun too. And, you know, a lot, met a lot of other people who are also into science too. So you got to talk um, with other people who knew, understood what you were actually talking about, which is great. And yeah, it was pretty fun. Cool. Well, thanks, Jade. I'm glad you were part of that program. Sounds like you had a good experience. And um, I think even just applying, right, just go for it and see if you get accepted. <laughs> I think that's a big takeaway for me, at least, right, for some of these programs you might be hesitant or on the fence about, but apply to them and, and, and see what you're offered. But yeah, it's definitely an, a chance to learn and about something new and like Tara says here, science is weird and cool. <laughs> you get to explore our bodies and how weird they are. Um, but yes, our, our bodies are pretty cool. <laughs> All right there. Um, let's see. Okay, let me make sure I'm not forgetting any. If you guys see hands up too, go ahead and like shout it out because I'm kind of I got a million windows open here. All right, so we'll move on to another question here. Um, Let's see, uh, la, la, la. let's go for Jessica. What advice would you give your high school or undergraduate self about exploring school and or careers? <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, high school. I feel like that's so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. I think the advice that I would give myself, especially in high school, is that you don't have to have it all figured out. Um, and just to try it. And if you fail, it's fine. <laughs> you know, uh, my personality back in high school was kind of, um, I guess, like, yeah, 10 years ago, I had this uh, perfectionist mentality, right? Where if I I have to do this and I have to do it right. And I can't fail because if I fail, 
that's just bad. I don't know what's going to happen, but it's just bad. So um, my mentality is do not fail because that is bad. Um, so my advice would just be like, if you don't know, you don't know, and it's okay to fail. And just what really matters is um, getting back up. You know, you can feel destroyed, but that doesn't have to keep you down. You have to get back up and keep trying and keep running. So um, that's the advice that I would give myself is just, it's okay, don't be scared to fail, just go for it. And you don't need to have an A to B plan, like just go for it. Totally. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica, yeah. Um, I wrote that down too from Tara's thing. Fail is the first attempt at learning. Um, I like that acronym. <laughs> So definitely a good lesson there. Thank you. Uh, question from the audience from Erica. Oh, just kidding. She was just repeating that. Sorry, in written form. So Tara poses a question here. Let's see. I'll pose this to Josh. Josh, who are some people in your support network? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, the biggest people in my support network come from a, a variety of places. There's, of course, family. Um, I feel like my my partner, my wife, is really an incredible person in allowing and supporting all of every, every endeavor that we've done together. She's a, a pediatric um, hospital medicine attending um, here in Cincinnati with me, and I I feel so lucky in that space. We met at um, as undergrads at UNM. Um, other people in my support network from a research standpoint, um, just a minute ago, my previous mentor, Tom Resta, was on this call, and he was super supportive in not only helping me think about science, but also helping me think about ways to advance my next steps in my career. Hey, Josh, you should really think about this paper. Hey, Josh, you should really think about this conference. Hey, Josh, you should really think about this grant. Um, oh, oh, I don't, I don't know if I, you know, I don't know if my ideas are good enough, Tom, we'll let, we'll write them down and let's talk about them together, put them together. And he looks at them and writes and like makes his comments and edits back and just having a person to really cheerlead in that corner has been super helpful. And even now, like, um, we moved from New Mexico in 2019 and to have him jump onto a space like this is just that kind of mentorship, I think is really important. Um, also, currently, um, one of the other things I'm learning is that it really helps to have different people in different avenues of your life. For example, I talked about family and science, but I also have an MD and I'm also a pediatrics resident. And so I have people in my support network that are more established doctors and pediatricians that help me think about how to take care of kids that are sick um, and help me think about my own decisions and um, would they have made the same decision? What are some areas that I still need to grow in? How can I continue to keep myself better as a, as a doctor who's learning? Um, and so I am learning and I'm valuing A, um, mentorship is so important. And it's hard to get started in an area like biomedical sciences because there's so much in it without I think having somebody that is in the field that can kind of guide you and help you as you continue your own journey. And then two, thinking about not just mentors in a given field, but kind of peppered in a bunch of different areas. You can have life mentors, career mentors, you can have personal mentors. And I think all of those people are really important. I mentioned a lot of people that are pretty you know, advanced in their careers, but it's also really important to have peer mentors. Like, oh man, I was in the lab today and my experiment totally didn't work. And so reaching out to somebody who's on your level and can say, and commiserate with you on that. See, you know, when I, when that happened to me last week, this is what I did, or, Hey, that really sucks. Let's go, you know, somewhere and talk about it. Let's have a meal together and let's um, create a space where we can be there to support one another. Um, and I, I, that stuff to me has been, I think some of the biggest difference makers in the ability to keep doing it all. Excellent, thank you, Joshua. All right, so we're at 3.20. Um, I think we'll probably start to wind down within the next five-ish minutes or so. Um, 
but this is going really well. I appreciate all the good feedback you guys are giving us. Um, and just again, talking about mentorship from your family to people who are already in the field, to your colleagues or your classmates. Uh, those are definitely good support systems to connect with. Um, and let's see, I, I guess, let's see. I don't know if anybody else has feedback on that question about who are some people in your support system. Um, if not, I think we can continue on. I'll throw out another question here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, Jade, could I call on you for this one? So as a current student right now, what is the best part of your school experience? And to counter that, what is the hardest part? Maybe start with the hardest part. That way we can end on a high note. <laughs> um, so from your school experience, what's been the hardest part so far? Um, I think the hardest part is probably asking for help. Yeah. Um, um, I kind of just think like I could do it on my own. So that's um, mostly I'm taking a lot of upper division classes. So that's kind of difficult at the moment. And so I think it's just willing to seek out the help, I guess is the hardest part. And I think the easiest is probably, um, I don't know, it's like um, undergrad. It's probably, I guess, all the programs offered, you know, on campus and what, um, and like different labs on campus. You know, there's a variety of everything. So it's just being exposed to, yeah, like, finding new interests, I guess. I, there's just so many options when you go into college <laughs> and explore all, all sorts of different things. Um, but yeah, thanks, Jade. Um, definitely, yes, asking for help. I don't know if any of our panelists have any advice on that part, but asking for help and how that can be a challenge, but how do you approach that? Any, uh, Jessica or Josh want to take that one? <laughs> yeah. Um... I think um, for me, it's literally the first, it's more of a mental retraining, I guess, for me to, um, I had to learn to ask for help, especially in grad school when um, doing a bunch of, a bunch of studies and a bunch of experiments at the same time and uh, forgetting that, uh, yes, it is, these studies are on me, but also I don't have to uh, freak myself out and stay 13 hours a day <laughs> just to try to do it myself. Um, so for me, my, I had to literally just push myself to be like, I need help. I need to ask for help. Um, there's no way that I can do this by myself. Um, and then pushing it back further to uh, my undergrad, um, there were classes where, you know, a lot of it was just like self pride, you know, where I'm just like, I don't need help. I was a good student in high school, I don't need help now. This is college, it's fine. Um, but a lot of it was just self pride. Um, and kind of, I had to shut that down myself um, and realizing that <laughs> I don't know everything. And um, I probably should go to these um, office hours, I think, where the were kind of like my own personal anxiety, because I was such a big introvert. Um, in college, and the idea of traveling across campus to talk to um, a professor who's been doing this topic for 20 plus years and telling them that I don't understand it, but they do, that was very intimidating for me. Um, but, you know, um, the first time I did it, it was intimidating, and but it's more of a practice that I had to push myself to do. And I actually got to know a lot of my professors very well. Um, a lot of them wrote my, um, my graduate support letters and some of them I still talk to, we still meet up for coffee and everything. And so um, it's literally just taking that first step. So that's that's how I had to get myself out of that comfort zone. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, one of the other things that I, um, is really important and I, it, 
it, it, I think is apparent every step of the way is that being in a space like biomedical sciences or medicine, um, as a person who's underrepresented, there are a lot of firsts in that space, like first in my family to go to college, first in my family to get a degree, first in the department to be um, a person who identifies as American Indian, first, so, so many firsts that when it comes time to ask for help, at least for me, a lot of times that space was, oh man, the thing I'm gonna ask for help is the thing that all my classmates already know um, and they have it all figured out already. And I felt like that was a failure on my part. And I don't know if that's so true anymore. Um, I feel like, in fact, maybe it's as a person who is doing this for the first time, that actually that's a, a statement about the whole system of it all. And it actually is the, the system that owes you an explanation. It's not your fault. It's the whole like structure of it. And part of asking for help is, and, and it's so intimidating is, feeling like, oh my goodness, how do I compare to my classmates? And one of the biggest things for me was to think about those people are not going to be there for like there for you the middle of the night when you have this, when you don't have an answer to this question, it's up to you to advocate for yourself. And the reality of you knowing or not knowing this thing that seemingly everybody knows is not your fault. Um, that is instead a reflection on you to be a learner and a self-starter and to trailblaze in a way that um, so many other people are looking up and like being excited about your effort. Excellent, yeah. The imposter syndrome, I think that's what you guys are talking about. That's a big thing, right? Um, another big conversation <laughs> uh, in itself, but um, there's some good feedback there. I hope. Hope that kind of helps you too, Jade. Um, but I appreciate everyone's um, feedback on that question. And it is important just to, yeah, just hear how you, I, I think that's been coming up a lot in this whole event is this whole thing of reflection. Like, okay, I'm at a point now where I might need to ask for help or I need to maybe reflect and see what I can do better. Um, so yeah, I feel like that's a big lesson here is, is reflection and, and knowing when to ask for help. Um, okay, so we're like two minutes till we close out. Um, let's see, I, I just wanna thank our panelists. I think we can pretty much close out from here, but I appreciate you sharing your time with us on a Friday afternoon. I know everybody wants to, Fridays it's time to split, but. <laughs> Um, it's been wonderful to learn more about your background and reconnect again, but um, appreciate you all being here this afternoon. Um, I don't know if there's any final comments from our panelists. Um, I'll open it up to you if you'd like to share any last comments with our audience, but um, again, thank you from everybody here. I just dropped in the chat my email and my cell. Um, if anybody has any questions about the journey that I had or about is biomedical science is something I should think about or what are some things that you were thinking about when you were in my space, in my um, like time on the like next steps pathway, I'm happy to talk about it. I'm happy to um, kind of explore that space with you. Thank you, Josh. Oh, cool. And then Jessie also shared hers. And then I, uh, if you scroll through our chat as well, um, a couple of us, other folks have shared their contact information. Definitely reach out. But uh, I think we are, if there's no other comments, I think we can close out. But thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us for this event. Appreciate you all. We have a short evaluation. Erica shared a link if you could give us some feedback on how today went and we can try and improve for future events. But um, I hope you all are safe this, and have a good holiday break coming up. But And for the students on the call, good luck with your finals and final projects and everything. But thank you, everybody. We'll have, have a good weekend. We'll see ya. Bye.